כל זמן, אחר כן אבוי, ויף על פי coming of Mashiach, and though he may tarry, yet I long for him. That's the 13th principle. Uh, it might be the 12th of the 13 principles of uh, Maimonides, and Maimonides' uh, 13 principles of faith, and a beautiful song. It's a melody by Shlomo Karlbach and sung by Eitan Katz on his album, Unplugged Number 2. Let's light up the darkness. Who is with us on a Wednesday night? Sharon in New Jersey, Stephen in New Hampshire, Paula in Chicago, Clarice says Erev Tova, good evening. Yehuda in South Carolina, James in Annapolis, Zach Blotzker, always great to see you. Checking in from Vegas, I believe. Melissa in Great Neck, Nancy in North Carolina, Guy in Dayton, Paul in the Great Northwest, Josephine says Shalom from Texas. I think that's a new name. Welcome, Josephine. Bella in Florida, Jesse, is that another new name? In Virginia, Lucy in Minnesota, Shandora in the Bronx, Belle in Texas, Michael Badgley, Shalom from Who's Your Land, Anderson, Indiana of all places. And is that a new name? I love seeing new names. Wonderful, wonderful. Tom in PA. Paula says, Erev Tov. Rick is in Chicago land. <laughs> and Rick likes that I remember to light the candle. Uh, over there on the YouTube side, Yitzhak in Kansas City. Faith in Southern Oregon. Aoife in Florida. Marjorie in Georgia. Liam. William Love from Scotland. And I believe that's a new name. Welcome, Liam. Great to have you with us. We are holding on page 72. Daf Iron Base here in Tractate. You have almost the 14th volume of the Talmud. We're in chapter 8. And even though this tractate is all about the laws of Yibum, Leverett marriage, we're kind of on an extended digression uh, because once we got into the laws of marriage and the particular requirements of marriage involving a priest who has additional restrictions that other Jews don't have, uh, it it led into other matters concerning a priest, priest themselves and whether a priest could eat teruma, consecrated food. We got to this by... You know, a woman who's the daughter of a Yisrael who marries a priest may now eat teruma, consecrated food that only priests and their families and their slaves can eat. But an uncircumcised priest cannot eat teruma, even though his family can. And so here we are in chapter 8 discussing the first Mishnah. We're still on the first Mishnah in chapter 8. Yeah, right. And we pick this up at the very bottom of page 71b. So the Gemara returns to the incident involving Joshua. Now that we were talking about circumcision, we came up with a cliffhanger yesterday at the end of class where the Gemara seems to imply that according to some opinions, the males born in the desert, right? The males who were born in the desert during the 40 years of wandering after the Torah was given at Mount Sinai and then the incident of the spies uh, where the people freaked out when they heard that there's a large, powerful people in the promised land that God said he would give to the Jewish people. And they said, oh, we're, we're not going to be able to defeat them. 
just crazy lack of faith, right? They were not be, they were not singing Ani Mamin. <laughs> uh, after God had performed 10 plagues and parted the sea and appeared to them personally to give the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, why would they doubt that God could give them the promised land uh, just because there was one kind of people or another living in it then? Child sacrificers, by the way. Uh, so God was fed up with that group, even threatened to destroy all of them and start over with Moses' descendants. But Moses begged God, no, have mercy. They'll say that you brought these people out here to the desert, not to save them and give them a promised land, but to destroy them. Uh, and the argument won out. But God said, this generation will not enter the promised land. Their children will. Well, speaking of these children... It says about them that when they finally entered the promised land, which we read about in the book of Joshua, the sixth book of the Bible, <clears throat> that for some reason they needed to be circumcised again. So one view is that while the Jewish people were circumcising their children from the time of Abraham on, so that's for several hundred years before the Torah was given, in which the actual laws of circumcision were described in the Torah, so the circumcision that they practiced pre the giving of Torah uh, was like a little bit inadequate. You know, they, they, they didn't take off enough of the foreskin. And once the Torah was given, then they needed to circumcise again to get it right. Okay, but why didn't they do that right after the Torah was given? Which leads to the view that for some reason they didn't circumcise the males born in the wilderness. And you would think, why on earth would they not do that? They have the benefit of the Torah in front of them. They have the benefit of Moses, the lawgiver, or the law recorder, really, uh, taking dictation from God personally. In such an elevated spiritual atmosphere with the Mishkan, the tabernacle, in their midst, uh, why would they not follow the simple law of the covenant, right? The, the covenant uh, that Jewish males are circumcised on the eighth day is a physical sign of the covenant between God and the Jewish people. How could they fail to do that? And yet that view exists in the Talmud. So let's read about that. So the Gemara returns to the incident involving Joshua. And what is the reason that they did not circumcise themselves in the wilderness after the Torah had already been given? This is not the universal view, but this is a view in the Talmud. And the Gemara answers, well, if you wish, say that it was due to the weariness caused by their journey. Since they were traveling continuously, they were too weak to undergo circumcision. You could refute that by saying that when Moses was told to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let my people go, he had a newborn son that needed to be circumcised. He actually uh, said, well, we're traveling. I'm not going to circumcise him right now. And then there was an incident where it said that God sought to kill Moses. A very weird, inexplicable moment in the Torah. And his wife, Zipporah, steps in and circumcises the child, realizing that the, the circumcision did need to be performed. So the fact that they're traveling doesn't seem like to be a reason why they wouldn't circumcise their children. And they're not traveling all the time. I believe I read somewhere else, I recall, uh, that during the 40 years of wandering, they never knew when they were going to travel the next day, which is closer to the issue. But there was one, one of the encampments, they were there, I think, for 19 years. I mean, after a while, you would think they would just circumcise, even though they might have to, you know, pick up camp the very next day. So a different reason. Now we're on 72A. And if you wish, say instead that it was because the north wind did not blow for them. And the hot weather was likely to lead to medical complications following the circumcision procedure. As it is taught in Abaraisa, all those 40 years that the Jewish people were in the wilderness, the north wind did not blow for them. The Gemara asks, what is the reason that the north wind, the wholesome north wind, did not blow for them all those years? Well, if you wish, say, it was because they were under censure following the sin of the spies and were therefore undeserving of this salutary and wholesome wind. Or if you wish, say instead that it was so that the clouds of glory covering the tabernacle should not disperse. 
I feel like we're getting a little lost in the weeds with that explanation. I mean, the clouds of glory were a gift from God, uh, which kept the sun off the Jewish people. And when we cover our sukkahs during the holiday of Sukkot, uh, with natural, you know, branches that grew from the ground, but which are not no longer attached to plants that are attached to the ground. The schach, it's called the schach, the, the covering of our sukkahs. Uh, they are meant to remind us of those clouds of glory in the wilderness, which are also associated with the merit of Moses' brother Aaron. Aaron. Uh, and so the clouds of glory were a tremendous kindness to the Jewish people because we're in the desert, the hot desert, right, for 40 years, uh, but always in the shade, right? Wherever the Jewish encampment was, there was these clouds of glory. They weren't storm clouds. They were just like a perfect covering of shade. So if you say that this north wind is a salutary north wind, then you wouldn't want to circumcise in the absence of that wind. Okay, but, you know, God could both have clouds of glory and the salutary north wind, but okay, that's another reason, possibility. Uh, and Rav Papa said, well, therefore learn from here that on a cloudy day or on a day that a south wind blows, which is not a wholesome wind, so then we may neither circumcise nor let blood, right? In the ancient world, that was a very common medical procedure, as common as taking aspirin, that when something was bothering them, they would let a little blood. So owing to the danger involved, but even at the times of the Talmud, so at least 1500 years ago, it says, but nowadays when many are accustomed to ignoring these safeguards, the verse, Psalm 116, verse six, the Lord preserves the simple is applied and it is assumed that they will not come to harm, even if they circumcise an eight day old child on a day when the south wind is blowing. Uh, or when it is cloudy. So the sages taught in Abaraisa, all those 40 years that the Jewish people were in the wilderness, there was not a day in which the north wind did not blow at midnight, as it is stated. And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord smote all the firstborn of the land of Egypt. That was the 10th plague and the one that resulted in Pharaoh saying, fine, go, take your people and go. Uh, so the Gemara asks, what is the biblical derivation? What are you saying? How can you say that the north wind, which was a wholesome and healthy and, you know, benevolent wind, always blew at midnight from the fact that the 10th plague occurred at midnight? What's the connection? Uh, how is it derived from this verse that speaks of the exodus from Egypt, that a north wind blew at midnight during the 40 years that the Jewish people wandered in the wilderness? And Gemara answers, this comes to teach us that a time of favor is a significant matter. Since midnight had once been a time of divine favor at the beginning of the exodus from Egypt, it continued to be a time of favor throughout the 40 years that the Jewish people sojourned in the wilderness. Rav Huna said, By Torah law, if one had been circumcised, but subsequently the residual foreskin was drawn forward by itself or manually, so that it covered the corona or some part of the corona, the head of the penis, so he may partake of teruma, meaning, meaning a priest, if this is happening to a priest, as he is considered circumcised. However, from the words of the sages, they decreed that he must be circumcised again because he looks as if he were uncircumcised. This matter of drawing forward, important to understand, and I remember reading about this in, um, I believe it was James Michener's book, The Source, uh, you know, which is sort of about an archaeological dig in Israel and, the, and, and sort of episodes of various characters in different ages who lived on that same spot, but separated by many centuries. Uh, and so at the time of the Greek occupation uh, of the Holy Land, you know, where uh, the Greeks like to participate in, you know, gymnasiums with naked sports. Uh, and if a Jew wanted to rise up in Greek society, he couldn't be a Jew. I mean, Jews were, were kept out. And so there were some Jews who would reverse the circumcision, an actual surgical procedure that existed way back then, right? More, 2,000 years ago, more than 2,000 years ago. 
It sounds crazy. What do you mean reversing a circumcision? But yeah, they would sort of cut some of the skin below the head and bring like a bit of a flap forward uh, that after it healed would basically reverse the circumcision. And they would also do that in times of danger, right? Where if, they, if, they, if somebody was, it's almost like if Nazis were coming around and saying, pull down your pants, and if a person was circumcised, they kill you, which did happen in World War II and did happen at some other times in Jewish history. Uh, and if one wanted to reverse the circumcision uh, to avoid getting executed in such a time of danger, it was permitted in order to save one's life. But once the danger passed, such a person would need to reverse the reversal, as it were, uh, and resume having the appearance of, uh, of the covenant, right? Uh, so the Gemara raises an objection to this, this idea that a priest uh, may partake of Teruma if you know he reversed that circumcision in a time of danger however he's still obligated when the danger passes to re, you know undo the reversal so the gemara raises an objection based on the following barisa one whose residual foreskin was drawn forward right in this process, procedure so that it covers the corona he requires a second circumcision indicating that he is not considered circumcised Right, so you would think if he needs to circumcise again, it would indicate that once he did that reversal procedure, he's no longer circumcised and therefore he should not, a priest who is in that condition should not be permitted to eat teruma. It would indicate, according to this Barisa, the Gemara explains, this requirement that you, you do a second circumcision to undo that reversal, this is by rabbinic law. But by Torah law, he is considered circumcised. He's a person, he's a Jew, he was circumcised. They brought that flap of skin back, you know, because there was danger or possibly because of his ambition to join Greek society. But it doesn't mean he became an apostate uh, and was, you know, worshiping other gods. Uh, but still, by rabbinic law, he needs to undo it. Yet by Torah law, he's still considered circumcised. And that's why a priest in that condition would be permitted to eat consecrated food, teruma. So the Gemara asks, and the Amora, the rabbi of the, of the Gemara, who asked this question, why did he ask it in the first place? The Baraisa merely teaches that such an individual requires circumcision and does not indicate that it is a Torah obligation. The Gemara explains, the Amora who raised the question made a mistake due to the latter clause, the later clause of the same Baraisa, which states, Rabbi Yehuda says, he should not be circumcised because it would be dangerous for him to do so. And his colleagues said to him, but weren't there many who had drawn their foreskins forward and subsequently were circumcised a second time in the days of Ben Koziva, who was otherwise known as Bar Kokhba. Right? So Bar Kokhba was a guy who was a false messiah in the time of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva actually thought he was the messiah. Uh, and it led to a revolt against Rome that succeeded briefly and then led to a genocide against the Jewish people where the Romans kill, came in, killed a million Jews uh, and salted the earth, right? And that's when the Holy Land, which is a land, you know, overflowing with milk and honey and produce, as, as it were, became much more desert-like. Um, and so during that great time of danger, which followed the Bar Kokhba revolt, uh, it seems like there were a lot of people who reversed their circumcision to save their lives and then later undid that reversal. Uh, and those people fathered sons and daughters. So such recircumcision, right, the second circumcision, is necessary. As it is stated, he must surely be circumcised. He mol ye mol. Right, again, this idea when the Torah repeats a word, he mol ye mol, mol is circumcision, like mila, same root, um, <clears throat> or it's the same word, it's just a different tense of it. Uh, but here, he mol ye mol means he shall circumcise, circumcise. In other words, we, and we usually translate it as he shall surely circumcise, or he will indeed circumcise. But really, they're repeating the verb for that emphasis. However, the rabbis from a, such a doubling will learn out an extra law. So the double verb form indicating even 100 times. If he has to, if he 
you know, he was circumcised, undid his circumcision, then he must re-circumcise. And if he did it again, bring that flat skin forward, he must re-circumcise again in order to be compliant with rabbinic law. And furthermore, it says, Genesis 17, 14, he has broken my covenant. That's the next uh, verse after he must surely be circumcised. Next verse, he has broken my covenant, which comes to include one whose foreskin was drawn forward. It's like he broke the covenant and needs to come back into the covenant. So the Gemara comments, what is the meaning of, and furthermore, it says? Why does the Gemara say this? Why was it necessary to cite two verses in support of the same law that one who drew the skin forward must recircumcise later? And the Gemara answers, the additional verse is necessary, lest you say that the first verse, he shall surely circumcise, comes only to include the shreds of flesh that invalidate the circumcision. If a circumcision was done by an incompetent moil, right, who didn't cut off enough skin and there were little bits of skin that still covered a bit of the head, so he didn't properly circumcise and got to go back and, you know, finish the job, as it were. We learned that from the first verse. Uh, And if so, uh, if so, come in here a second verse, he has broken my covenant, and that one comes to teach that if somebody undid the circumcision by drawing a flap of skin forward, it later needs to be undone to return to a proper uh, circumcised condition. Now, he, the Amora, who raised an objection based on the first part of the Baraisa, thought that since at the end of the Baraisa, the Tana, the rabbi of the Mishnah, brings a derivation from a verse, so this law must be by Torah law. But in fact, that is not so. It is only by rabbinic law that this drawn forward flap must be drawn back. It's a rabbinic law based on an interpretation of a Torah law, but it's not an actual Torah law. Uh, But in fact, this is not so. It is only by rabbinic law. And the verse quoted is not a Torah law. It is mere support for this rabbinic law. Now, the rabbinic law is the halacha. It's the law that we have to follow, but we always make a distinction whether we're following a written Torah law or a rabbinic decree uh, which was, you know, enforced not because God gave it, but as a fence around the Torah to make sure we don't come to violate written Torah laws. Now, the Gemara raises an objection from a different source. A priest who is a tomb tomb may not partake of teruma. Right, so we've learned before the the Talmud has four genders: male, female, tomb tomb, and andrigonos. Tomb tomb. Uh, is one who we're not sure what the sex is because the sex organs of the baby are covered by a flap of skin. That happens in the real world. Uh, These days, they would just probably perform a little surgery at the hospital, remove that flap of skin, and you'd see, does the baby have a penis or a vagina? In the old days, they would just wait <clears throat> and that skin, and that flap of skin would be would probably you know re- remove itself in time. And the andrigonos, also known as the hermaphrodite, uh, is a person who has both sex organs of a male and a female. These are obviously very rare conditions, but in one, the person is apparently both male and female, and in the other, <clears throat> we're not sure because we can't see. So, in the case of the tomb tomb. A priest who is a tomb tomb may not partake of teruma, the consecrated food, but his wives and slaves may partake of it. So a priest who had been circumcised, but subsequently the residual foreskin was drawn forward, and similarly one who was born circumcised, i.e. without a foreskin, he may partake of teruma. A priest who is an andrigonos, possessing both male and female genitalia, Uh, and who was circumcised on the male genitalia may partake of teruma. As whether he is male or female, he is entitled to eat teruma, but he may not partake of sacrificial food, which is permitted only to male priests, as he might not be a male. A priest who is a tomb tomb may not partake of teruma or sacrificial food, as he might be a male, and and if he is a male... He's not circumcised, right? We're not even sure if he's a male. That means that that penis was never accessed to perform a circumcision. So if he is a male, he's an uncircumcised male, and therefore he can't eat teruma. In any event, this Barisa teaches that a priest whose foreskin was drawn forward and one who was born circumcised 
may partake of Teruma. And this would seem to be a conclusive refutation of the opinion of Rav Huna <clears throat> that a priest whose foreskin was drawn forward may not eat Teruma, at least by rabbinic law. And the Gemara concludes, this is in fact a conclusive refutation of his opinion. So a priest, when a time of danger, drew his foreskin forward to cover up the fact that he was circumcised, uh, he should eventually re, you know, undo that by rabbinic law, but even in the meantime, he may eat teruma, consecrated food. So the master said above in a barisa, a priest who is a tomb tomb may not partake of teruma, but his wives and slaves may partake of it. Now the Gemara is puzzled by this teaching. From where does a tomb tomb have wives? If he does not have a visible male organ, how can he marry a woman? If we say that he is merely betrothed to a woman, as it is taught in other Baraisa, if a tomb tomb betrothed a woman, his betrothal is a valid betrothal, because he might be a male. And similarly, if he was betrothed by a man, because he might be a female, his betrothal is deemed a valid betrothal, as he might be a female. So there is a difficulty. Now, one could say that the Tana said that the betrothal of a tomb tomb is valid only as a stringency, i.e. out of concern that he might be a male, and therefore the woman cannot leave without a proper bill of divorce. But should we say that his betrothal is valid also as a leniency to allow his wife to eat teruma? There is uncertainty here that perhaps he is a woman, and one woman cannot betroth another woman. Abaye said the Tana is referring to a tomb tomb whose male organ is hidden, but his testicles are visible externally. Since it is evident that he is a male, he can betroth the woman even though he cannot have relations with her since his penis is covered up. And by the way, he has not been circumcised because of it. Now, Rav has said a different answer. What is meant here by the word nashav, which refers to the wives, if a priest has wives, which was translated earlier as his wives, but it can also be understood as his women. It refers here to the priest's mother, who after her husband, the priest, has passed away, she continues eating teruma by virtue of her son. Now, the Gemara questions this interpretation of the Baraisa. His mother? It is obvious that she may eat Teruma on his account, as he is her offspring by a priest. The Gemara explains, This statement is nevertheless necessary, lest you say that only if the priest is capable of having children does he enable his mother to eat Teruma. But if he is, if he is incapable of having children, he does not enable his mother to eat Teruma. And therefore, a tomb tomb who cannot have children, at least while he's in that condition, should not enable his mother to eat teruma. Therefore, the Tana teaches us that this is not so. As a woman may eat teruma by virtue of the child she bore a priest, even if that child is incapable of having children. Come in here. Come in here a proof in support of Abaye's opinion from that which is taught in the latter part of the Baraisa. A priest who is a tomb tomb may not partake of teruma or sacrificial food. Now there's a difficulty here as the law that a tomb tomb may not partake of teruma was already taught in the first part of the Baraisa. So what is the latter part of the Baraisa teaching us? Granted, according to Abaye, the Tana of the Mishnah teaches in the first clause of the Baraisa that the halacha, the law governing a tomb tomb, who is definitely uncircumcised, i.e. one whose testicles are visible externally, he is a male, but he's uncircumcised, so that he is definitely male, but he cannot undergo circumcision because his member is hidden. And then he teaches the latter clause of the Baraisa, the law governing a tomb tomb, about whom there is uncertainty, whether he is an uncircumcised male or whether he's not even a male at all. So one whose genitalia are completely hidden so that he might not even be a male and then he would not be subject to circumcision. But according to Rava, why do I need the repetition of the law governing a tomb tomb in the latter clause? The Tana already stated that the law in the first part of the Baraisa. The Gemara answers, what is this tomb tomb referred to in the latter clause? It is a man who is definitely uncircumcised. The Gemara says, well, now if a tomb tomb about whom there is uncertainty as to whether he is uncircumcised may not partake of teruma, as stated in the first clause of the Baraisa, can it be supposed that a man who is definitely uncircumcised may eat teruma, so that it was necessary for the Baraisa to teach in the latter clause that he may not do so? The Gemara answers, he is saying 
what is the reason? The Baraisa should be understood like this. What is the reason that a tomb tomb may not partake of Teruma? It is because there is uncertainty as to whether he is uncircumcised. And an uncircumcised priest may not partake of Teruma or sacrificial food. So the Gemara suggests, let us say that this Amoraic dispute, a dispute in the Gemara, as to whether or not one who had been circumcised but his residual foreskin was drawn forward, is considered uncircumcised by Torah law, that this dispute is parallel to a different dispute, uh, the, the following one between Tanaim, rabbis of the Mishnah, as it is taught in the Tosefta, Shabbat 16.7. One whose foreskin was drawn forward, and similarly, one who was born circumcised, and a convert who converted when he was already circumcised, and a child whose appropriate time for circumcision already passed, and he was still uncircumcised, and all others who require circumcision, which, as the Gemara parenthetically adds, comes to include one who has two foreskins, both of which must be removed, all these people may be circumcised only during the day, in daytime, during daylight. Rabbi Lazar ben Shimon says, if the circumcision is performed at its appropriate time, i.e. on the eighth day, they may be circumcised only during the day. However, if the circumcision is performed not at its appropriate time, then they may be circumcised either during the day or night. Now, what? Is it not the case that they disagree about the following? One sage, meaning the rabbis who disagree with Rabbi Lazar ben Shemin, they hold that the obligation to circumcise one whose foreskin was drawn forward is by Torah law, and therefore he must be circumcised during the day, despite the fact that the procedure is not performed at the proper time on the eighth day of his life. And the other sage, Rabbi Lazar, ben Sh- Rabbi Lazar Bar Shimon, holds that the circumcision of one whose foreskin was drawn forward is by rabbinic law, and therefore it can be performed day or night. So the Gemara rejects this suggestion. We're on 72b, by the way. And how can you understand the disagreement in that way? With regard to a child whose appropriate time for circumcision has already passed, is there anyone who says that the obligation to circumcise him is only by rabbinic law? Even after the eighth day, there is certainly a Torah obligation to circumcise him. And yet, the Tanaim disagree about this case as well. Rather, everyone agrees that the obligation to circumcise one whose foreskin was drawn forward, it's by rabbinic law. And that the obligation to circumcise a child whose appropriate time for circumcision has already passed is by Torah law. Here, what they disagree about is this. One sage holds that we expound the phrase, and on the day, in the verse Leviticus 12, 3, and on the, day, on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. And the superfluous word, and, which is just the prefix v, right, at the beginning of a word, indicates that even if the child was not circumcised on the eighth day, the procedure must still be performed during the day. And the other sage, Rabbi Lazar ben Shimon, holds that we do not expound the phrase and on the day, and therefore a circumcision may be performed during the day only when it takes place on the eighth day, but if it takes place on any other day of the child's life, it could be done in the daytime or at night. As in the case where Rabbi Yochanan was sitting and he expounded Nasar. Nasar is this principle that when the temple is standing, or the tabernacle, and they're bringing offerings, depending on the type of offering that it is, uh, there is a, if, it's a, if it's an offering, part of which is eaten, right? An Ola offering is a burnt offering, which is consumed entirely by the altar. But like the Corbin Pesach, just some of its blood goes on the altar and then the people eat the rest of it. Or a sin offering, most of which goes up on the altar, but some of which is eaten by the priests. So these offerings of which a part is eaten by people, there's a time limit for eating it, right? And then Nosar and Pigul are concepts of Nosar, if it, if it gets eaten, if somebody eats of it past the time when it was already expired. And Pigul is when you have an intention at the time of slaughter that you're going to eat it past the time when it would be expired, and then it's invalidated immediately. Okay, but here we're talking about Nosar. So Rabbi Yochanan was sitting and he expounded. Nasar, the flesh of an offering that is left over beyond its allotted time, requires burning. If it is burnt at its appropriate time, i.e. on the same day that it became Nasar, so it may be burned only during the day, 
And if it is burnt not at its appropriate time, it may be burnt either during the day or at night, presumably akin to this idea that a boy who is circumcised not on the eighth day of his life could be circumcised during the day or during the night, uh, according to Rabbi Lazar. So Rabbi Lazar raises an objection to the opinion of Rabbi Yochanan from the following Baraisa. I have derived only that a child who is circumcised on the eighth day may be circumcised only during the day. From where do I derive to include in this law a child who is circumcised on the 9th, 10th, 11th, or 12th day? From where is it derived that he too may only be circumcised during the day? Therefore the verse states, and on the day, which teaches that the obligation to circumcise during the day extends beyond the 8th day, which is the ideal time to circumcise, the, the commanded time. And when, when is a child not circumcised on the 8th day? Because he's a tomb tomb, or because his brothers died uh, when they were circumcised on that day, or because he's a hemophiliac, or there's some other medical condition, you know, the reasons why we wouldn't do it on the eighth day. And even the sage, who does not expound the letter vav, meaning and, as superfluous, right? Some of the sages will, anytime that there's a and, included in a verse, and the verse would have the same meaning without the word and in it, even though it's just the prefix in Hebrew syntax, right? You just add the letter vav at the beginning of a word. It means and or but. Uh, so some of the sages will say, if that word is unnecessary to understand the meaning of the verse, it must be there because we are to learn another law from it. And other sages say, no, and it's just a vav. It's just the Torah speaks in the language of men, and we don't learn additional laws from it. So now we're going to make a distinction between the ones who do interpret from the extra word and and those who don't. <clears throat> and even the sage who does not expound the letter vav meaning and as superfluous, they do expound when there's a superfluous vav and hey, not just and circumcision, but and the circumcision. Here, it didn't need to be said. It didn't need to be stated that way. So when you have an additional vav and he, and the, or and that which, is what those words would mean. Uh, so then they, when they come together like this vav and he at the beginning of a word, uh, we understand them as alluding to cases that are not explicitly mentioned in the biblical text, but which are going to be part of the Torah law. So regarding nasar, the verse states, and that which remains, vehanosar, of the flesh of the offering on the third day shall be burnt with fire. When the letters Vav and He come together to teach the obligation to burn the Nosar, this sac part, the, the edible parts of a sacrifice that have gone past their deadline, uh, that they must be burned during the day, and that this com and that this requirement extends beyond the third day. Rabbi Yochanan was silent as he had no response. After Rabbi Elazar left. Rabbi Yochanan, who was impressed with Rabbi Luzer's exposition, said to his friend and debate partner, Reish Lakish, I saw that Rabbi Luzer, the son of Pedat, was sitting and expounding the Torah as if he were Moses, who had received it directly from the mouth of the Almighty. I mean, he was really impressed with the way Rabbi Luzer was making this uh, exposition of law from the Torah. How did he do that? So Reish Lakish said to him, was this exposition his own? No, it is a baraisa. And Rabbi Yochanan inquired, where is this Baraisa taught? Rabbi Yochanan was not familiar with it. And Reish Lakish answered him, it is in Torah Kohanim, otherwise known as Sifra, which is a work of halachic midrash, uh, you know, so expositions by earlier sages on the book of Leviticus. When you see the word Sifra or Torah Kohanim, it's the same thing, and it's a collection of rabbinic teachings based on the book of Leviticus. Uh, and Rabbi Yochanan went out, and he learned the entire Torah Kohanim in three days. And he reached a full understanding of it in three months. And Rav Steins also has a note on this. Uh, Rav Sharira Gaon writes in his famous epistle that this is one of the proofs that halachic midrashim, midrashim, right, plural of midrash, despite their importance as early sources, were not as widely studied as the Mishnah itself, in which all sages were fluent. And this can be seen from the fact that even a sage of Rabbi Yochanan's stature was unfamiliar with Torah Kohanim. As for the time it took him to study it, this is recorded as a reflection of his greatness in Torah, as this halachic midrash is considered particularly difficult and complex, so much so that the Tanaim themselves would learn it only a little at a time, 
And yet, Rabbi Yochanan was able to complete it in a very short period. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip a, a, a couple of paragraphs now uh, and pick it up here. Rav Yosef said, this Tana of the Baraisa, who disqualifies one who is uncircumcised from sanctifying the purification waters, right? So we're talking about, can a priest who is uncircumcised eat teruma? No, but he can serve in the temple, right? Because that is not... Uh, it's not required that he be circumcised in order to perform that service. So, for example, a rabbi for whom it would have been, a, a priest for whom it would have been dangerous to become circumcised, he can eat teruma, but he can perform service in the temple. But not all services. Now they're making a question, well, what about sanctifying the purification waters? And what does that mean? In the time the temple was standing, when a person came into contact with a dead human body, uh, he would get corpse tuma, a very high level of ritual impurity tuma, uh, and that would require purification by these waters of purification, the sprinkling of a mixture of water and the ashes of the red heifer. There were only nine red heifers in all of Jewish history. Uh, a pure, pure, a cow with not, you know, pure red, which is like a rust color, uh, and no other markings on the cow at all. It's only happened nine times in Jewish history. Uh, and sometimes when a cow is born that seems like it might be such a cow, people think, oh, the, the, the Messiah must be coming because here's the red heifer and we're going to need it uh, when the temple gets rebuilt by Mashiach uh, and the priests are going to be able to begin serving there again. And the whole world is considered impure by corpse tuma because we haven't had the waters of purification in millennia. At any rate, the question here is being asked, can a priest who is uncircumcised create the waters of purification, meaning mix the ashes of the red heifer with that water to sanctify those waters, to make them into the waters of purification? Do you need to be a circumcised priest in order to perform that function? Rav Yosef said, this town of the Baraisa disqualifies one who is uncircumcised from sanctifying the purification waters is a Tana of the school of Rabbi Akiva, who includes the uncircumcised in the same law as that which governs any ritually impure person. If you're uncircumcised, it's like you're Tameh. The rabbis who disagree with Rabbi Akiva don't hold that way. As it is taught in a Baraisa, Rabbi Akiva says that the words ish ish, right, any man, in the verse any man from the seed of Aaron, the priest, who is a Mitzora or a Zav, shall not eat of the holy things until he be pure. And this comes to include, because ish ish, a man, a man, uh, it comes to include one who is uncircumcised, according to Rabbi Kiva. And it is prohibited for him as well, like an impure person, a ritually impure person, to partake of teruma, consecrated food. And so too with regard to other matters as well, like sanctifying the purification waters. One who is uncircumcised has the same status as one who is ritually impure. Rava said, I was sitting at the time before Rav Yosef, and I had the following difficulty with his statement. If so, according to Rav Yosef's opinion that the uncircumcised and the ritually impure have the same status, right, like, like Rabbi Kiva said, should one not be able to find a Tana? who teaches the halacha of the uncircumcised and of the ritually impure together, and we should say that this is the opinion of Rabbi Akiva? There should be some source that reflects this view. And the Gemara asks, and is there not such a source? But isn't it taught in a Baraisa? One who is uncircumcised and one who is ritually impure are exempt from making an appearance in the temple on each of the three pilgrimage festivals. You can't enter the temple if you're Tameh, and you can't enter the temple, apparently, if you're uncircumcised. But the Gemara refutes this argument. Nah, this is no proof. As there, it can be argued that one who is uncircumcised, he's exempt, right? He's not prohibited from entering the temple. He's exempt from coming. He's not obligated to come. Uh, but it, why is he exempt? There is no proof, as there it can be argued, that one who is uncircumcised, he's exempt from appearing in the temple on pilgrimage festivals because he is considered repulsive. And it is unbefitting that one who is uncircumcised appear in the temple courtyard. But this does not mean that with regard to other matters as well, he is treated like one who is Tameh. And the Gemara comments, and the rabbis and Rabbi Yehuda follow their usual line of reasoning with regard to a hermaphrodite. 
as it is taught in Abaraisa, all are fit to sanctify the purification waters, except for a deaf mute, an imbecile, and a minor. And Rabbi Yehuda deems a minor fit for the task, but deems a woman and a hermaphrodite unfit. And the Gemara explains what is the reasoning of the rabbis who disagree with Rabbi Yehuda, as it is written. And they shall take for the impure of the ashes of the burning of the sin offering, and he shall place it on running water in a vessel. And the juxtaposition of the placement of the water to the gathering of the ashes indicates that they are governed by the same law. Therefore, those who are unfit for gathering the ashes are likewise unfit for sanctifying the waters. And those who are fit for gathering their ashes are likewise fit for sanctification. And a woman is fit to gather the ashes of the red heifer, and so she may sanctify the waters. You're asking, can an uncircumcised priest sanctify the waters? It doesn't even have to be a priest. It can be any Jew, including a woman. What is the law? Who is fit to sanctify the purification waters? And I'm almost done, so if you have questions or comments, get them in. Who is fit to sanctify the purification waters? Everyone is fit to sanctify the purification waters by adding the ashes of the red heifer, apart from a deaf mute, an imbecile, and a minor, in accordance with the opinion of the rabbis. I don't think that, that person, any person can do it if they're Tameh. You have to be Tahor. You have to be in a state of ritual purity. But you don't need to be a priest to do that. You don't even need to be a man. Okay, let's go to the questions and comments. <clears throat> On Yevamo 72. Oh, Nina is reminding me to mention that at nightfall tonight... Uh, well, I'll say that last night, today, we counted the 32nd day of the Omer. And the day which follows, I'm, I'm obviously not saying the number on purpose, the, the day which follows the 32nd day of the Omer period is known as Lag Omer and is usually celebrated in a big, big way. Uh, this is understood to be the day on which the students of Rabbi Akiva ceased dying from a terrible plague that killed thousands of them. And it's the yard site uh, of the Rashbi, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who is credited with authoring the Zohar, the original version of the, so the Zohar, and really, you know, being like the leading light uh, in disseminating Jewish mysticism in Talmudic times. He was a refugee from Roman persecution, and he and his son hid in a cave for 12 years. Uh, and during that time, they were just engaged in mystical practice and eventually learned enough uh, you know, to sort of bring down and share, at least among the sages, these very esoteric teachings of Jewish mysticism. And so Lag Omer is often celebrated by you know, very joyous singing and dancing and around a bonfire. Uh, so we'll see tomorrow in Israel, uh, I think they're gonna do it. The problem is there was a tragedy last year. There's such a huge crowd at the bonfire in Meron uh, where the kever, the grave of, uh, of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is, uh, that there was some kind of a terrible stampede and 45 people, I mean, people engaged in a religious pilgrimage were there and were trampled and died. Uh, so definitely our joy is tempered this year uh, by that memory. But nevertheless, uh, it's a very auspicious time for weddings and other uh, celebrations. Uh, here on the day following the 32nd day of the Omer. I, I say it that way because we're always careful not to count a day before it's time. So we don't count until night arrives. We do it at the end of evening services. And we've been doing that every day since the second day of Passover. Okay, Tom, regarding eating Teruma. What about a Kohen who could not be circumcised because he was never well enough to undergo the procedure? Right, and it seems like that person is not considered uncircumcised, right? We, it, 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 it was a little bit ambiguous. Like we sort of passed that teaching a couple times and it's unclear, you know, if he, if he chose or if his father chose not to circumcise him for some ideological reason. Okay, that's an uncircumcised priest. He definitely may not partake of Teruma. If it was dangerous, uh, like a priest whose brother has died, then at least according to some opinions, he's not considered uncircumcised. He's like, he was not subject to circumcision. And in the case that you're describing, maybe he, that applies to him. Lucy, how can a tomb tomb be a priest as a priest has to be a male? Well, a tomb tomb might be a male, right? 
And, and so I think that's why they were giving that case of, well, the penis is covered by that flap of skin, but if his uh, you know, genitals show, uh, then he's definitely a priest. Uh, if he's female, he's the daughter of a priest, right? As the daughter of a priest, uh, she can eat teruma because she's the daughter of a priest. Uh, and, you know, if he's the son of a priest, then he can eat on account of his father and on his own account. Uh, but because he's defi- if he is a male, he's definitely not circumcised. That's why he can't eat teruma. Yitzhak, during the hopefully brief time that a Jew is forced to have their circumcision reversed, are they still permitted to recite the blessing over the Torah, have a Jewish wedding, etc.? Uh, it seems like yes, right? Because they're even allowed to eat teruma uh, by Torah law. It's just that there's an obligation on them that when the danger passes, they need to be recircumcised, as it were. But by Torah law, they're still considered circumcised during that period. Sharon, every column of Torah other than the first begin with a vav. In some Torahs, right? You're talking about a Vav Torah. Uh, So Sharon's alluding to that there's a kind of standardization of Torah scrolls uh, where they will arrange that every column of the Torah will begin with a Vav in front of a word. Uh, Not all Torahs were written that way, but it's definitely come to be a standard, uh, standardized way of, for, for, for a sofer, for a scribe to write a Torah. So every column of a Torah other than the first begin with a Vav. Uh, the word, not the letter, means hook. So the letter looks like a hook as it means and, and it links all of the Torah together. I often unroll a few columns of Torah to show this to the kids. Very nice. Thank you. And Sharon also says, I know it is stated somewhere in either uh, Torah, meaning the first five books, or in the book of Joshua, that the Israelites did not circumcise their sons in the desert due to the risks of the desert. As You probably wrote that before we got to that in today's daf. And I have been trying to find it as well as listening. So now you saw it, right? This idea of the risks of the desert, meaning they didn't have the salutary wind. They were always, uh, you know, traveling. It was considered unhealthy. That is definitely not a universal view. Uh, So a different view. Uh, And I saw a note about this, actually. Yeah, I was going to read that. Here's a note from Rav Steinsels. What is the reason they did not circumcise themselves in the wilderness? The idea that circumcision was not practiced at all in the wilderness is puzzling for several reasons, as mentioned by the early authorities. See Tosafot. A novel opinion of the Geonim, see these are later commentators, is that it does not mean that the entire people did not circumcise themselves in the wilderness. Rather, it is referring only to those born after Moses' passing and until their entrance to Eretz Yisrael. So that, that was a short time, right? Moses died and then Joshua leads the people in. So maybe it just refers to people who were born during that time, a, a subgroup of the males born in the wilderness. So interesting question. Uh, we only get partial answers tonight. All right, my friends, that's what I have for us tonight. With God's help, we'll be together again tomorrow. I want to mention... Uh, I'm going away next week. Uh, I'm going to a family event uh, that's going to keep me away for an entire eight days. So our last class uh, before I leave is actually going to be Friday. I'm not going to be able to teach Saturday night. Uh, then I'm away for a whole week, uh, returning on that Sunday. And so we'll have that class, you know, Monday, like a week from this Monday is when we'll resume. So class tomorrow, Thursday, class on Friday, and then no class until I return, uh, you know, I guess nine days later on that Monday. All right. Just giving you a heads up on that. But with God's help, I'll see you tomorrow.